Hey friends, Rob here. Uh, so great you can join us today. Well, there have been some massive church splits in the history of the church. Uh, some really serious things like the divinity of Jesus or, you know, how is a person saved? Is it by faith or works? From baptism to the Lord's Supper, from scripture to the Holy Spirit, some of these things have caused some massive splits in the church. And some of them, can I say, were needed. But there have also been some big fights over things that were nowhere near as important as those. Some of them actually today still cause some of the biggest divisions in church. Let me share a few of them with you. Things like the colour of the carpet when it's time to be replaced. Or uh, the choice of the chairs when, you know, new chairs, time, what do you get? Do you get pews? Do you get single chairs? Do you get the cushion ones or plastic chairs? What colour do you get? Which way should they face? Some of these things have been serious issues. Other things like music choice, music style. You know, do you go the old hymns or modern songs? Uh, you know, it doesn't need to be more heartfelt or no, we need more truth. In a church I visited in Africa a few years back, uh, this church had three different choirs because they couldn't agree on which songs they wanted to do. And so the service would go for like 20, 25 minutes longer while each group did their own round of songs. Other things like the air conditioning temperature. You know, senior pastor Ray, he prefers, it seems to always be a little bit hot for Ray. Uh, for me, I'd prefer it freezing all year round, summer and winter, because I'm such a sweater. Other things like dress code can be a big issue, especially on stage. For a lot of people, shoes off on stage is a no-no. Uh, I heard recently of a church petitioning for all their pastors to be clean shaven. Well, being a Lebanese man, I probably wouldn't get hired in that place. People have left churches over the decisions about what coffee beans to use in the coffee ministry. And for me, a few years back, one of the biggest troubles I had in a church was about how we set up the church Facebook groups. In COVID times, to sing or not to sing, that can be a heated debate. Well, here in this passage, we see one of the first church quarrels. And up until now, the heat's kind of been coming from the outside, but now the heat's starting to rise on the inside. And rather than this being about a trivial thing, it's actually a quite, quite a serious issue. So let's check it out. This is the presenting issue in verse 1. It says, In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Okay, so we have a problem, but it's important to note that it's a good problem. Don't know if you notice that. What does it say? The number of disciples was increasing. Praise God. And this is also after being heavily persecuted. The church is still growing. But with more people comes more complexity. And so these widows are missing out on the daily support. Now, remember, back in chapter 4, People were sharing all their stuff. They were selling fields and bringing the money to the disciples, so to the apostles, to distribute to whoever was in need. Now, up until this point, the apostles have been overseeing the whole thing, the teaching, the organizing of the church, and the social needs of the people in their community. That is 12 guys for thousands of people. And it seems like their hands are full, there's a load of work to do, and stuff's falling off the table. No, we've all been there before, haven't we? Too much to do, the calendar's full, something's got to give, who or what is going to fall off the table? How do you make that decision? Who do you prioritise? Well, something important also to notice here is that this ministry to the widows was a service to those inside the church. See, these widows are Christian. They're possibly relatives of other Christians who were a part of this new community of believers. This daily distribution is a ministry to those within the Christian community. This is not an example of the early church's endeavour to relieve Jerusalem of poverty and hunger. These weren't just hungry widows needing a meal. This isn't your downtown food shelter where anyone could just turn up and grab a warm meal. This ministry is not a wider social justice endeavour. Now, that's not to say that that kind of thing is not important or needed or good and right. It definitely has its place in the Christian life and in the wider witness of the church. It's just not what was going on here. See, what's going on here is a demonstration of the body of believers sharing and caring for one another inside the church. 
It's a continuation of that beautiful picture that we saw back in chapter 4 when not one person was in need. That is, it's doing the Christian life together well. Although, at this point, they're not doing so well. And so what do they do? Verse 2. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together, that's the whole church, and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. You see, what was the thing they couldn't let fall off the table? It's the ministry of the word. And why is that? That's because the church's mission is accomplished through the ministry of the word. The church's mission is accomplished through the ministry of the word. That is, the gospel is a message. And if the the message stops going out, the church ceases to exist. The church is is not merely a social club, but a spirit-filled community brought into existence by people putting their faith in the message of Jesus' death and resurrection in their place. The church exists, it grows and continues by the ministry of the word of God. And these apostles have been specifically entrusted with that ministry by Jesus himself. If they let this slip, wow, they have failed. But there's a whole lot more that needs to happen within the community. And a commitment to the word doesn't make all that stuff unimportant. The word must go out, but the church also needs to function. People need to be loved and cared for. And I think we can often create this unhelpful priority to the two things and almost make them opposed to one another so that serving one another's needs and organizing the church can almost be seen as an enemy to the word ministry. That is not the way the Bible speaks about them. The Bible actually holds them together much more tightly. You see, this passage is saying, and this is the point here, both things are extremely important, but both accomplish different things. Get that? Both things are extremely important, but both accomplish different things. You see, the poor and struggling won't be fed or cared for if no one helps feed or care for them. It doesn't happen if we don't do it. But likewise, the lost will not be saved if the gospel is not preached to them. Food will not save anyone from eternal hell into eternal life. In the same way, the gospel doesn't just magically make food and clothes appear on the kitchen table. You see, both need to happen, but both aren't the same thing. Let's have a think about each one of them. You know, Jesus said the church will be known, it'll be identified by the way that we love and care for one another. In the Old Testament law, God was always concerned for his people to be looking out for those in need, the the down and out. And Actually, I've been reading Jeremiah recently, and it's been really interesting how when God judges his people, it's often because of their lack of care for the kinds of people like widows and orphans and the poor and the needy, the voiceless among them. They just kept overlooking them. And the New Testament's also flooded with calls to care for the weak, to support the poor, to practice hospitality, to share with one another. It's a call to use the things that we have to ensure that other people are getting on okay. It's a call to live sacrificial lives of love for one another in the church. That's what Jesus calls us to. We're a body and we function together well as we care equally for one another. It's kind of like trying to walk when you've got a sore toe. You know, it's just one small piece, but it really throws the whole body out of whack, doesn't it? Well, God also says the church is built on the foundation of the scriptures, the apostles and the prophets. And the way it grows and functions well is by being fed with God's word. And so we're called to teach the word, to guard the word, to obey the word and to be transformed by the word. I think... 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17 sums it up really well. It says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The word flowing out into the good works. And Jesus also said famously in Matthew 4, 4, Man shall not live on bread alone but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. You see, a well-functioning church 
Make sure both of these things are happening. Okay, so what was their solution? How did they make sure that both things kept happening? Have a look at verse 3. So it says, brothers and sisters, this is what the apostles say, choose seven men among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom, and we will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. Now notice here what kind of people were raised up. It wasn't just people with the right skills, but with the right convictions and the right character. Firstly, these men are well-known among the community. They've been tested and approved. They're also full of two things, the Spirit and wisdom. Now, being full of the Holy Spirit means, firstly, they're believers. That is, they've been united to God by His Spirit. They believe in Jesus Christ. But they're also following the Spirit's lead in all areas of their life. You see, to have the Spirit and not be filled by Him is to be at war with Him as He seeks to work in all the areas of your life. It's saying yes when He says no or saying no when He's saying yes. These men are working to align their whole life with His will. But they're also full of wisdom. Now, wisdom, according to the Bible, is usually in regards to having a right understanding of God, right view of God, and so being able to make good decisions in life because of how you know how how God works. These men are mature Christians. They listen to the word and they do what it says. But I think there's a challenge there for each one of us as we reflect on these guys. See, ask yourself the question, would you have been chosen as one of these men? And if not, why not? What what are the areas in your Christian life that are lacking at the moment or getting in the way of you fully committing yourself to God's work? Really helpful question to ask possibly another friend as well, if maybe you're blind to those areas. Now, this particular role of theirs is later described in the Bible as being a deacon. Now, you might have heard that word thrown around at MBM recently, a a deacon, especially as we've been talking about the pledging series and the deacons taking care of that. In 1 Timothy 3, Paul describes these differing roles of elder or pastor, uh, overseer, and deacons. Now, the word deacon literally means a servant. It's the Greek word where we get our word ministry from. It's really the act of doing a service. It's uh, being a middleman, kind of taking one thing here and passing it on over there. And this passage here in Acts contrasts two kinds of ministries, serving or distributing food to the widows and serving or distributing the word. So the apostles here are calling on the church here to gather a group of people together to take up and oversee this ministry to the widows so the word doesn't have to stop. Now, our deacons here at MBM essentially do the same thing for us pastors. They work at a higher level, kind of overseeing uh, things like the finances and the property and building stuff, a lot of the the behind-the-scenes managing of uh, what goes on. And they do those things so us pastors don't get completely bogged down with those important things and then can't continue to commit ourselves to teaching and pastoring and praying. And we thank God for them. And can I ask you to do the same thing? I just want to stop now and actually just publicly honour those who are our deacons at the moment. And if you you didn't know who they were, uh, there's there's four of them uh, and and a, a larger team. There's Steve Pieri. John o. Anderson, Ed Johnson, and Aaron Kalfas. And we want to say thank you. Uh, if you see those guys around, thank them. And you would also need to know that those, those guys also have been very heavily committed to word ministries in the past, running growth, group, um, running growth groups or leading in other various ways, even some right now continuing to lead in growth groups or other word ministries. Actually, this week I asked one of them, uh, what do you love about being a deacon at MBM? And his response was very interesting. Listen to this. This is what he said. He said, the deacons meeting is honestly the one meeting I've never dreaded going to. (laughs) All you guys who hate meetings, become a deacon. He said, it's such a joy to work with some amazingly skilled guys to take care of a range of things so our pastors can focus on the main game, people and Jesus. And he said, it's also really good being able to do stuff behind the scenes and not have to be up front. And at the moment, I also need to mention two other people. That is Bruce Winters 
our executive pastor, and Leanne Shepherd, who runs our front desk. And those two just run, they just enable so much ministry to go on and function. And behind them, there's also a huge team behind. Even now, as I speak, Andy Kerr stands behind the camera, making sure that this sermon is able to go out online. We just want to publicly thank them and, and we say we honour you. Uh, it was also really beautiful to see on Monday after our staff meeting, uh, we had spent some time in prayer together in little groups praying for one another and for the church and, and other things. And when we stopped praying and looked up, I was standing next to Ray, and we looked out the window and saw our brother Warren Cushert outside weeding the gardens. And you know he takes care of all the gardens around the place and, and makes them really sweet as they are. And then also seeing Frank Spiteri and his team wandering around the church, taking care of all the maintenance and the other stuff around the place. It's just such a beautiful picture. And you know, it's not only the official deacons who are involved in organizing and overseeing things to ensure that the word isn't neglected. Everyone who helps out in any way around the place to free up others who have been equipped to do word ministries, whether that's kids ministry, youth ministry, leading growth groups, whatever it is, you are ensuring that the ministry of the word continues. You're ensuring that Christian growth can continue to happen. You're ensuring that lives are saved and you're ensuring that the, the mission of the Lord Jesus doesn't come to a screeching halt in our generation or in our church. And so I want to say thank you, but continue also to pray for those who do commit themselves to word ministries, that they would remain faithful in their devotion to it. It's a big task as, lo- as well as all the other things. Okay, so, so what happens here? Uh, How does the church respond? So they've got all the church there. What do they do? Verse 5 and 6, check it out. It says, This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them, pretty much saying, we are with you and we're praying that God would be too. Now, if you know anything about the origin of names, you'll notice that these men that they've chosen have Greek names. That is, they chose Greek men to care for their own Greek widows. Those who had the issue have now become the solution to the issue. And as you know as well, those who know their culture well generally serve better for their culture. And if you know anything about the next few chapters in Acts, These two two of these guys end up out there preaching the word in massive ways. Next week, we're going to meet Stephen, who ends up giving a powerful speech to the Sanhedrin uh, as he's accused of testifying about Jesus and then even gets stoned for remaining faithful to Jesus. And he's our first Christian uh, martyr. And then Philip, who also goes out evangelizing the towns all around Jerusalem, Uh, and then also meets the Ethiopian eunuch and sees him converted. You see, it's not about doing one or the other, but it's what Peter says in 1 Peter 3.15. He says, In your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be ready to give a reason for the hope that you have. See, whether you make coffee, set up seats, serve morning tea, or help people drive into the car park. If you're a Christian, we're all playing a part in the ministry of the word and the growth of the church. Amen? Now, honestly, I think those people who say, oh, you know, I'm not really one to speak up about Jesus. I I just help people out as they need it. Like, I know it can feel safer. You know, there's less heat in that way. But I think as someone once said, this challenges me too. How much do you have to hate someone to have the life-saving message of Jesus and not share it with them, knowing that they're entering into hell. You see, love does both, right? It helps the person in their need and seeks to hold out the gospel at the same time. Well, what was the result? What happened? Verse 7, check it out. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. You see, a transformed community transforms communities. If you remember back also the chapter just before this, who were the ones who were persecuting the apostles? It was the priests. And now with the apostles freed up to focus on prayer and the word, these priests are turning to the Lord Jesus. That's so good. 
Now, let me say a few things here in reflection on MBM and on this passage. At MBM, we are committed to the word and prayer. That's why each week you'll see us open up the Bible and preach. That's why we run run kids church and youth group and growth groups and why we have prayer meetings designated just to spend time in prayer. It's why we also pray in our staff meetings all the way through the week. All our meetings are flooded with prayer. It's why we're also committed to seeing all our members in smaller gospel communities in our growth groups during the week where the word is opened and which is also where a lot of prayer happens. We're also committed to training up those leaders who do deal with the word so that we can all continue to grow together. And if you're one of those people who would love to be trained up and growing in the word, please come and talk to us. We'd love to speak to you. But it's also why we don't load up our church calendar with a bunch of really fun social events but we make sure that we guard the the times when the word is open. We guard church and we guard our growth groups and we guard our Explaining Christianity course. We are committed to people hearing the word. But we're also committed to people being cared for. And so we also see that happening in our growth groups where you can know one another more deeply, be known and know others so you can actually know how to care for them more personally. But also, that's not the only place that care happens. I was really encouraged when COVID first hit to see people putting their hand up to assist anyone who had any need in any way. And so we ended up at MBM setting up our care at mbm.org.au email, where anyone who needed assistance could just email in and we could help them. And listen, if that's you at the moment, please don't do what these Greek Jews did and just grumble about it, but get in touch with us so that we can help you in your need. Thirdly, we're also committed to seeing every member playing their part and so that we can all function better together. You know, you have gifts that God has given to only you. And what a blessing that we can be to one another and to the gospel as we put those gifts into practice. Now, if you haven't found your place in a a serving team or in a serving role yet, please come and speak to us. We'd love to help you do that. But mainly... We want to keep asking the honest question here at MBM about what we might be doing that's getting in the way of the word going out. And we want to ask you to help us to continue clearing blockages and being solutions for those problems so that we can see a Western Sydney who know and love the Lord Jesus, who are, have a, a secure place in heaven waiting for them, and who are also right now being transformed by his spirit. Will you pray with that with me now? Father, we thank you so much that you have given us your word and the clarity that you've given us to not only the gospel, the clarity of the message going out, but also that we need to function well as a church. And we thank you for all the different gifts you've given each one of us. Lord, would you help us to be united in purpose, that we might be on about the gospel and on about loving each other so we can see a Western Sydney and the rest of the world who know Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.